More teachers around the country and here at home are questioning the possible effects of active shooter drills on students and staff. More cases of the novel coronavirus confirmed in Texas. In a day before the 184th anniversary of the fall of the Alamo, the state of Texas's lieutenant governor is raising concerns about plans for the Alamo Plaza redesign. Thanks for joining us for KSET News at 9, streaming from right here in the KSET 12 newsroom. I'm Patty Santos filling in for Myra Arthur. Well, active shooter drills are common in schools now, but two national teachers unions say instead of preparing students, the surprise drills are creating a traumatic experience. Tiffany Huertas takes a look at how drills are impacting teachers and students here in San Antonio. We need to stay as quietly as possible. Uh, it's almost like a game of hide and seek and we're gonna wait until our visitor comes into our classroom and uh, they open the door for us. And it's a drill that's intended to keep us safe. Imagine three-year-olds in pre-K in this situation. That's the drill David Garza has to go through with his class at Head Start at Dezavala Elementary School. The day of the drill, I'll go through a little reminder with my students and I'll let them know this is something that's going to be coming up. San Antonio ISD says they conduct lockdown drills. Lockdown drills are different from active shooter drills, according to every town for gun safety. Students and staff remain confined to an area in lockdown drills, unlike active shooter drills, which are tailored to specifically address active shootings. But not every school district around the country gives advance notice and some worry about the impact that could have on the mental health of students and educators alike. That's why the American Federation of Teachers, the National Education Association, and every town for gun safety teamed up and made recommendations on active shooter drills and proactive school safety solutions. In their report, they mentioned ways experts have found that can help protect students' well-being. For example, drills should not include simulations that mimic an actual incident. Parents, teachers, and students should have advance notice of drills, and schools should create age and developmentally appropriate drill content with the help of school personnel. Here at home, president of the San Antonio Alliance of Teachers and Support Personnel, the union that represents SAISD teachers and employees, says they are talking to teachers at the district about lockdown drills and collecting information. Potter says they are also working with the district on other improvements. One of the major things we've been focusing on as a union this year with, our, with the district is the need for all of our classroom doors and all of the office doors in our, our school buildings and offices in the district, that, that those be able to be locked. Potter says drills can be traumatizing for students, especially the young ones. When we're talking about our younger kids, when we're talking about three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. When I was coming to school myself, I also didn't have to go through these kinds of drills, and it just it's just a reminder of the things that we have going on in our society right now. I wish there was more that could be done on the state level, uh, legislatively, but until then, these are the things that we're having to do to keep our students safe. Every school district defines drills differently. At Northside ISD, they conduct two active shooter drills a year. They do not use shooting sounds, fake ammunition, and banging on the doors. Instead, they secure the rooms and hide in place. Patty? Thanks, Tiffany. To the latest on the coronavirus outbreak, two more cases have been confirmed in the Houston area. A Harris County man and woman are the third confirmed cases in the greater Houston area. Last night, we told you about a presumed a presumptive positive case in Fort Bend County. Now, health officials say these new three patients all contracted the virus while on a trip to Egypt together late last month. Meanwhile, Texas Governor Greg Abbott announced today that the state now has the ability to test for the coronavirus. State testing is conducted by public health labs throughout the state that are a part of what is called the Laboratory Response Network. There are 10 public health labs within the Laboratory Response Network in Texas. And one of those labs is in San Antonio. The San Antonio lab isn't able to conduct tests yet, but will be able to by the end of this month. Metro Health says their lab just received the kits, which need uh, two to three weeks to validate before they can be used. 
And here are the latest numbers. The novel coronavirus has now killed more than 3,300 people worldwide. Most of those deaths are in China. There are now more than 95,000 global cases in more than 80 countries and territories. Now here in the U.S., the Senate has approved $8.3 billion in emergency spending on the outbreak. A woman accused of murdering her missing stepson, a pilot injured after his plane flips on an airport runway, and a sluggish chase involving a tractor caught on camera in North Carolina. Here's tonight's 9 at 9. Here's tonight 9 at 9. The Colorado woman accused of murder in the case of her missing stepson appeared in court today. Letitia Stock was arrested this week. Gannon Stock hasn't been seen in five weeks. His body has not been found, but investigators do not believe he is alive. His mother is demanding justice for her son. Obviously, we know what the worst news is. But the best news is, is that justice will be served. And I'll make sure that justice is served because my boy did not deserve any of this. After deliberating for seven hours yesterday and finding her guilty of intoxication manslaughter and intoxication assault, there's another job for the jury. It must now consider how she should be punished. Prior to their deliberations, the jury heard emotional testimony from the sister of the man killed in the crash and from a survivor. Everything changed. My parents will never be the same. Think about that day every day. In Wisconsin, a pilot hospitalized after a small airplane flips at a Wisconsin airport. The plane is a single-engine Cessna that was flying for FedEx. There is snow accumulation in the area, but it isn't known if weather played a role in the accident. The pilot was the only person on board at the time. Here at home, a woman left without a home after a southeast side house fire. The fire broke out at 3 in the morning at the home on Schneck Avenue. My clothes, my car, everything is gone. The woman says despite the loss, she's trying to remain optimistic and is thankful that she made it out okay. Facebook says it will now remove some Trump re-election campaign ads to prevent confusion about the upcoming census. Facebook has come under fire for letting the Trump campaign run ads this week, asking people to respond to an official congressional district census. In addition to age, name and contact information, the survey includes questions about the views on President Trump, Nancy Pelosi and the quote, radical left agenda. Mortgage rates just hit another low. The Federal Reserve announced an emergency rate cut, slashing the benchmark interest rate range down to 1% to 1.25%. That cut, along with a rock-bottom 10-year Treasury yield and continued coronavirus fears, means mortgage rates could be poised to head even lower. A slow-speed chase caught on camera in North Carolina. Police say a man was reported operating a bobcat tractor in an erratic manner. That kicked off a sluggish pursuit. Eventually, the Bobcats operator was apprehended and taken into custody. An Indiana police officer attacked by a feral cat. Get out of here. Police say the animal jumped on the officer and scratched and bit him. Eventually, the cat was collected by animal control officers. But the officer later went to a hospital and received treatment for his injury. Tito's representatives are responding to social media posts that incorrectly imply their vodka can be used in lieu of hand sanitizer. The CDC requires hand sanitizer to contain at least 60% alcohol. Tito's vodka is only 40%. To read more about these stories, head to ksat.com. A lot of wind yesterday, but not so much today. Oh, it was so beautiful today. So nice out there. And we're going to keep the pleasant weather going tomorrow. Things will start to change kind of subtly by the weekend. All in all, not too bad, but it will start to feel very spring like out there. Even today, our high temperature was 75 sunny, 75. We will take that any day of the year. That's for sure. Our average high temperature here in San, San Antonio this time of year is 71. So we were awfully close to that today. We'll be in that range again tomorrow. It's getting cool out there this evening. 58 at the airport, 56 in hello to 60 degrees in Castroville right now. And we'll see temperatures fall down into uh, the mid 40s by early tomorrow morning. 45 out the door in the morning under mostly sunny skies. Weather 
won't, you know, won't want, make you want to stay in bed or anything like that. But since it's Friday, I said go ahead and grab the large cup of coffee uh, just to get you going. But it's going to be beautiful weather tomorrow. Starting off cool, so maybe a jacket or a light sweater. But dress in layers because by the afternoon we will be back in the low 70s. Uh, east northeast winds about 5 to 15 miles per hour. A little bit of a breeze here and there. And you'll notice tomorrow some high thin cirrus clouds filtering in with that cloud cover starting to get a bit more thick as we get into Friday night and especially into Saturday. Saturday still a really nice day. Humidity will continue to be on the lower side. High temperatures upper 60s, low 70s, but some more clouds rolling in and then by Sunday morning we're going to start off overcast and gray with humidity really starting to build in during the day on Sunday. So a gradual increase in cloud cover as we head into the weekend. As far as any rain chances though, that's going to hold off until very early next week. We'll have another low pressure system moving in from the West Coast, but it's really not going to start to affect our forecast until late next week. Until we get there, as we get into Monday, Tuesday, we're just going to have a couple of very weak pieces of upper level energy moving in overhead. And for the most part, that just continues continues to filter in the cloud cover next week, but we will have a low wind chance of a passing shower as we get into the day on Monday. Not everyone will see rain, but some passing showers will be possible. The countdown to spring is on. We are not including today 13 days away. It starts two weeks from today, so getting closer and closer to the start of the new season. And I want to show you an interesting graphic uh, I came upon today. And what this shows is across the country uh, when the change in first leaf is happening. What does that mean? First leaf? Well, that's when our plants and trees start to uh, show their first blooms, indicating warmer weather and the arrival of more spring like temperatures. Well, since 1981 here in San Antonio, we're seeing spring arriving uh, about three days earlier or that first leaf day uh, trending three days earlier and across the country. The change since 1981 is 70 per 76% uh, of cities are seeing those warmer, more spring like temperatures settle in sooner. So look how we'll be feeling next week. Very, very spring like with high temperatures, upper 70s and low 80s. What's not really shown here is that it's also going to be quite muggy as we get into next week. So it will definitely be feeling very spring like. I wish we could get a little bit more rain going. I think the best we'll do is uh, some late day showers Thursday into Friday of next week. Patty. All right. Thanks so much. You're welcome. We'll be right back. We're here at home. It's the eve of the 184th anniversary of the fall of the Alamo and Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick is sounding off on plans to redevelop Alamo Plaza. In a statement today, Patrick called the project badly off track and placed the blame on the General Land Office, which oversees the project. The Lieutenant Governor criticized the design he had seen for the plaza and says he is opposed to moving the Cenotaph. District 1 Councilman Robert Trevino says the city's Historic and Design Review Commission has already approved the move. Now uh, it's, it's uh, uh, being reviewed by the Texas Historical Commission and uh, those are the final steps in uh, what we hope to have uh, uh, begin here in just a matter of weeks. So we're, we're ready to go, we're ready to start the construction. 
Other elements of the Alamo Master Plan include restoring the church and long barracks and creating a visitor center. Turning to tonight's top stories, the Border Patrol says arrests have increased for the first time since the height of the crisis last year. The agency apprehended more than 30,000 immigrants illegally crossing into the U.S. from Mexico in February. That's up from January's numbers. IKEA has recalled more than 800,000 dressers due to a tip over hazard. IKEA says it has received six report of tip overs involving the three door colon chests. These incidents have resulted in two minor injuries. In 2016, the furniture retail giant recalled more than 17 million dressers for the same reason. Some children have accidentally been crushed to death or hurt because people didn't attach the dresser to the wall. Senator Elizabeth Warren has ended her presidential campaign. This comes after she had a very poor showing on Super Tuesday. That disappointing performance was just the most recent loss in a downward trend. Warren came in third in Iowa, fourth in New Hampshire and Nevada, and in a distant fifth in South Carolina. Warren says she needs some time to think about endorsing another candidate for president. And just a reminder, KSAT News at 9 is helping you stay informed this election year. We have a newsletter breaking down the big races and political news. The Vote 2020 newsletter is emailed out every Tuesday. To sign up, just go to ksat.com slash newsletter. Well, it's Thursday night, which means it's time for another Throwback Thursday here on KSET News at 9. This is the series where we take the popular hashtag and highlight an iconic person, event, or place in our community. Tonight, we get an inside look at the original donut shop. RJ Marcus tells us why there's no better combination than fresh, fresh donuts and delicious breakfast tacos. For years, the Original Donut Shop has made it its mission to give customers the best of both worlds, fresh tacos and donuts. Patrick Morris opened the shop on Fredericksburg Road in 1954 under a different name. He loved donuts. <laughs> and so he wanted a place where he could have donuts anytime he wanted. And so he started, um, he started the company, it was called Hot Donuts. In the early 80s, the Morris family decided to expand with a kitchen and start serving breakfast tacos and Mexican food. Around the same time, the shop changed its name to the original donut shop. Today, it remains a restaurant where customers sit, talk, laugh, and more importantly, a place that tastes like home. Some of your fondest memories are gonna be around food. It's gonna be around the smells, the tastes, the conversation, the laughter. And so we're sort of an extension of that, your family table. The bakers get in at two in the morning to get the donuts ready. The cooks get in at four. It's these people, the people behind the counter, that make the shop what it is today. People like Olga, who has been a cashier for more than 30 years and rides the bus at 4.30 in the morning to get to work. The feeling is that we are not just an employer employee, we are a work family. The shop has gone through some recent changes to keep up with customer demand. drive through lines sometimes extend to the street. Along with now accepting credit cards for purchases, the original donut shop extended its hours to 6 o'clock at night. That includes a full menu, including the tacos, and of course, the delicious donuts. While customers keep coming, one of the biggest debates remains, tacos or donuts. I find that people who come in for tacos inevitably see the donut counter or smell the donuts and are like, well, you know what, uh, I definitely need to get a dozen. As the original donut shop moves into the future, there are links to the past. People share their stories on the shop's social media pages, reminiscing about great food and the family atmosphere. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard about people who are like, I sat at this very counter with my grandmother and my great grandmother, and or you know, my my great grandmother would take my grandmother and my mom, and, and now they're you know, and now I'm taking my kid. Throwback Thursday, just one of the series we feature here on the News at 9. Here's a look at some of the others. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for a look back at the week's biggest local news stories.
Well, let's check in with what's trending with Ferris and Bowie. Ferris, you have dancing dads, cats. What, what else is going on? I got a ton of fun stories for you. So happy to be sharing them with you today, Patty. Uh, but yeah, the first story of the day is a couple of dads who got inspired to do their own cheer routine for their daughters. I mean, why not, right? Yeah, it's really an interesting thing. I know there's a lot of stuff going on with cheer right now, especially with that documentary on Netflix. A lot of people are talking about it. So these dads, um, they're the fathers of a cheerleading team out in New Jersey. Uh, you know, they were, in, I guess, inspired to try to do their own routine, and so they practiced for six weeks, um, really did uh, an interesting routine. They had tumbles, pyramids, all the things you can expect. And uh, you know what's great is the dad said they, they found a newfound respect for what their daughters it's do. It's hard. I mean, if you've never tried dance, it is hard. It's a lot of work. I, I got my parents to go see me, but I never got them on the dance floor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. It's something else to see the dads out there. Of course, they don't look as agile or as nimble as, as, <laughs> the, more as the cheerleaders do. But you know what? They had a lot of spirit. And uh, you're right. It's great to see them be out there. And, um, you know, the video went viral, and, and they're getting a lot of love for it. Just nice to see dads, uh, you know, uh, doing what what their daughters like to do. Getting new, involved. New way to bond. Yeah. Uh, moving on to our second story, uh, Patty. Now, this is unfortunate. If there's a Baby Yoda toy you've been hoping to get your hands on, you may have to wait just a little bit longer. Yeah, what's going on? Well, so with the coronavirus, there's been a lot of manufacturing concerns. As you know, a lot of these toys are made in China um, in a lot of different manufacturing companies over there. So. Uh, those concerns, if they linger into the summer, they may be affecting a lot of the toy production. And Baby Yoda has been a toy that a lot of people have been looking forward to. It's new and people want it. So if you have one, I guess, hold on to it. Yeah, they passed, uh, you know, Star Wars had passed on, you know, making the production, or I believe it was Hasbro that was the company, but they passed on producing it until after the first season. So no spoilers uh, were out there or anything like that. So a lot of people want this. Um, they think that they'll still be able to meet demand, but their production has been uh, diminished by just about 10%. So it's a really tough store. You may have to, uh, you know, sell these uh, on eBay or find it in the, on the black market. I was going to say, you might have to pay a little more yeah. if you want that for your... If you're one of those dancing dads that wants to right. <laughs> make your dad happy. Well, hopefully it's an official one. If not, I have knockoff Yoda products oh, uh, well, on my go. line. I'll pitch that to you guys <laughs> later. It's all good. And our last story of the day is about the Cadbury Bunny tryouts. And my choice, a fat cat is a one of the top 10 finalists. You know, I didn't bunny. know this was going on because I have a cat. I should have put my cat in this. Is your cat as fat as Lunchbox mm, here? I mean, she's just fluffy, but that is an adorable cat. It really it really is. Now, Lunchbox is one of the top 10 finalists for this Cadbury Bunny tryout. I've been saying that Cadbury bunnies have been bunnies for too long, yeah, frankly. Yeah, it's time it's, to give others a chance. It's time to put a cat in charge. And you know, you see the bunny ears on them. It's a perfect fit. I'm a big fan. I actually voted for him today. I went on the website as soon as I saw this. And, and I do we have a link on Earth? There's a link where you can go vote for him. And uh, also, if you're wondering what other animal can I vote for, possibly, there is a uh, no drama llama named Consuela who <laughs> made the top 10 as well. So I'm going to uh, go with the cat. A lot of tough choices in that. But um, whichever way you vote, it's just important you make your voice heard. All right. That's what they tell me, at least. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. All right. We'll be right back. It breaks my heart that, that he sat there, but I think that it was destined that he, that he went there that long until I was ready for another dog. All right, that's all the time we have for the KSET News at 9. Thanks for watching. The Night Beat starts in about 30 minutes.